So today we will be <coughs> discussing the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is entitled uh, Transcendental Knowledge or Jnana Yoga. Lord Krishna begins this chapter by describing the history of the Bhagavad Gita. Several millions of years ago, Krishna first instructed this Bhagavad Gita to the Sun God. Now, why did he instruct it to the, specifically the Sun God? That is explained. The sun is the king of all the planets and the sun god rules over the sun planet. This sun planet is controlling all other planets by supplying heat and light. The sun is rotating in its orbit under the order of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna therefore made the sun god his first disciple to understand the signs of Bhagavad Gita. The sun god after receiving this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita from Krishna, he instructed the same to Manu. Manu is the father of mankind and Manu in turn instructed this same knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to Ikshvaku. Who is Ikshvaku? Ikshvaku was the first king of the earth planet in the present millennium. In this way, the science of Bhagavad Gita was received through the chain of disciplic succession. What is disciplic succession? Just like sun god is the first disciple to receive this knowledge directly from Krishna. So then the sun god becomes the guru, the teacher to instruct it, instruct the same knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to Manu. Manu becomes the next guru to instruct this knowledge to Ikshvaku. In this way, Krishna tells that in the chain of disciplic succession, guru to disciple, guru to disciple, generation after generation, this knowledge has been actually coming down, the same knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, which Krishna instructed the Sun God. But in course of time, this knowledge was lost. And therefore, Krishna is telling Arjuna, that ancient knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, I am now instructing that same knowledge to you, Krishna is telling Arjuna, because he is telling Arjuna, you are my devotee as well as my friend and therefore you can understand the transcendental mystery of this science of Bhagavad Gita. So here, one important point is that there is a certain qualification required for understanding the mystery of Bhagavad Gita. What is that qualification? One can understand Bhagavad Gita if one is a devotee situated in a relationship with Krishna. So the approach to Bhagavad Gita should be in a mood of devotion just like Arjuna approached Krishna. Arjuna said 
to Krishna when he was confused about his duty, I am a soul surrendered to you as your disciple. Kindly instruct me. So this is the mood of devotion. And only in this mood if one approaches the study of Bhagavad Gita can one understand the mystery of the science of Bhagavad Gita. Now Arjuna is asking Krishna a question. He didn't ask any question at the beginning of this chapter. He is asking Krishna a question now. Arjuna is saying, the sun god is senior by birth to you. He is telling Krishna. How can I understand that in the beginning you instructed this science of Bhagavad Gita to the sun god? So Krishna's reply to this question by Arjuna is very significant. Krishna tells Arjuna, many many births both you and I have passed. I can remember all my previous births but you cannot. Now why is it that Krishna can remember and Arjuna cannot? So it is explained that Krishna, even though he keeps taking birth in this world again and again, he never changes his body. Krishna's body or we say Krishna's form is spiritual and it is never changing. Uh, what is the meaning of a spiritual body? Spiritual body is not like our body which we have now. Our body is called a material body. Material body as we all know changes from childhood to youth to old age and finally it perishes at the time of death. But a spiritual body never changes. It is eternally youthful and this spiritual body has no birth. Obviously, therefore, it doesn't have any death, no old age, no disease, no fear of coronavirus infection. Now, what Krishna will explain is how we can get that spiritual body, each one of us, if we understand what Krishna is explaining in this chapter. So listen carefully now. Krishna says the speciality about Krishna's birth. Obviously Krishna's birth is not like our birth. Whenever we take birth, we are forced to accept this material body, not out of choice. We are forced. But Krishna never accepts a material body. He comes in his original spiritual body, which is always eternally youthful, beautiful. So Krishna says <clears throat> to Arjuna, the secret of his repeated uh, birth in this world. Actually, Krishna's birth is called by a special name, Incarnation. You would have heard the word Incarnation. In Sanskrit, we say Avatara. Krishna's Avatara. God's Incarnation. Hmm? So, that Incarnation, it appears like Krishna is taking birth. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, we know, Krishna was born as the son of another king, Vasudeva. So what is this birth of Krishna as the son of Vasudeva? 
it appears like ordinary birth but krishna says no he says although i am unborn that means krishna never takes birth like we do and his transcendental body never deteriorates now we should understand from the bhagavad gita as we have discussed in the second chapter that for one who is born there is death and for one who dies there is birth birth or rebirth since krishna never dies there is no birth for him or there is no rebirth for him therefore krishna says he is unborn and his transcendental body or spiritual body spiritual body never deteriorates never changes never becomes old and although krishna is always in his original position as the supreme lord of everyone still krishna incarnates in every millennium in his original transcendental body so this is the speciality about krishna's birth in this world strictly speaking it is not a birth ha huh? prabhupad uses the word appearance appearance and disappearance hmm? he comes and he goes he comes from the spiritual world to this world to our world and he goes back to the spiritual world that in effect is what is krishna's uh, birth and his there is no death for krishna we say disappearance <clears throat> now when does krishna incarnate he says in every millennium when does he incarnate specifically krishna says whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice and when there is a predominant rise of irreligion at that time krishna says i incarnate in this world why does he incarnate he says he incarnates for three purposes to deliver the pious people to annihilate the miscreants as well as to reestablish the principles of religion krishna says i incarnate for these three purposes in every millennium what is the benefit of understanding all these special things about krishna krishna says one who understands this transcendental nature of krishna's incarnation and activities such a person upon leaving the present body that means when such a person dies he will not take birth again in this world but he will go to krishna's personal spiritual planet so understanding krishna's uh birth in this world understanding the nature of krishna's activities is going to give us a spiritual body like krishna's and in such a spiritual body we are transferred to krishna's spiritual planet we are transferred to krishna's spiritual planet never again we have to take birth in this world in another material body never again we'll have to suffer disease or old age or death or rebirth hmm? 
now krishna further elaborates how does this happen that understanding the peculiarity of krishna's birth and activities in this world how does it work krishna says that by getting this knowledge a person becomes free from three things attachment fear and anger now these are three disqualifications for any one who wants to uh, go to krishna's uh, spiritual planet so you can become free from all kinds of attachment all kinds of fear and especially he mentions this anger becoming free from anger in this way one can become fully absorbed in thought of krishna and take complete shelter of krishna alone see this is in contrast to our normal way of living in this world where we are always having some fear we have some attachments we sometimes become angry even though we may try to control anger not always we are successful in controlling our anger and then we also try to take shelter of so many different other things in this world but somebody who has got proper knowledge about krishna such a person never takes shelter of anyone else or any other arrangement such a person takes complete shelter of krishna only and the result is by taking shelter of krishna by becoming fully absorbed in thought of krishna one becomes purified of all reactions and in that purified state krishna says one becomes eligible to go to krishna's spiritual planet in the spiritual world now krishna further explains his actual position when he incarnates in this world some more details so that we don't mistake krishna to be taking birth like another ordinary person no even though he is born as the son of a kshatriya people may think oh he is another kshatriya krishna says he is not actually a kshatriya he doesn't belong to any classification of people of this world because his position is the supreme lord of everyone and everything so even when he takes birth as a son of king vasudeva in this world his position is unchanged he still remains the supreme lord and his position as supreme lord particularly he mentions here that as the lord of everyone it is krishna only who gives reward for every activity every person performs everyone is very much anxious no about the result of the work they do they want success so who is awarding the success and as people think success is in my hands if i do things properly with proper determination with proper understanding with expertise with skill i can be successful in all my endeavors but actually people are mistaken krishna reveals here that he is the one who gives the result of any activity anybody performs in this world because he is the lord of everyone now as far as krishna himself he is concerned he has 
no need to do any work for getting any result because he is the Lord. And therefore, understanding this truth about Krishna, because people try to uh, uh, understand Krishna by analyzing some activities he performed when he incarnated, let's say, 5,000 years back. Whether he did things right, whether he was uh, following some rules or he was breaking some rules. Now such analysis about Krishna is completely wrong because Krishna is not a person who has to work for getting some benefit or result. He is the Lord. So therefore he says Understanding this particular position, supreme position of Krishna, a person can become free from all reactions to all the works he does. Simply understanding this fact about Krishna. Now, Krishna says, tells Arjuna, that in the past, many kings like the sun god, Manu, Ikshvaku, whose names he mentioned in the beginning of this chapter, all of them, they acted with this understanding of Krishna's spiritual position, spiritual nature. And thereby, they be all became completely free from all reactions. So he tells Arjuna, you should also perform your duties following in their footsteps so that you can also become free from all reactions to your work and thereby become eligible to go to Krishna's spiritual planet after quitting this present body. Next, Krishna explains uh, the secret about different kinds of activities a person can perform in this world. Generally, people who are conversant with some Vedic knowledge, they know there are two kinds of activities, uh, pious activities and sinful activities, generally called as Punya Karma and Papa Karma. Krishna explains, apart from these two types of activities, pious and sinful or punya and papa, there is a third kind of activity that Krishna describes as devotional work. Many people don't know this. Only those who study Bhagavad Gita can understand there is a third kind of activity we can perform. Now, what is the need for this third kind of activity? People would think, as long as I do pious work, that's good enough for me. No, Krishna explains, both pious work and sinful work are giving reactions, which is the cause of our bondage, our accepting repeated birth and consequently suffering in this world. So, if you want to completely become free from repetition of birth and death, you should perform devotional work. Now, devotional work, Krishna explains, is performed in full knowledge about certain things. Uh, Krishna describes the characteristics of a person who has full knowledge because of which such a person always performs devotional work and never becomes entangled in any reactions. Some of the characteristics he mentions, such a person works 
without any desire for sense enjoyment common people as we all know ordinarily if they do some work it is because they want to enjoy but krishna says devotional work is of the nature that or characteristic that one performs devotional work without any desire for sense enjoyment now such a person his work is uh, free from all reactions because the reactions of the work are completely burnt away by the fire of perfect knowledge see the power of knowledge uh, there is a common english saying knowledge is power here we can understand what is the power of transcendental knowledge spiritual knowledge what is the power it can burn away the reactions of all work like this krishna explains several characteristics of a person who works in proper knowledge spiritual knowledge and the conclusion is if you want to really become free from all reactions you have to do devotional work now in the chapter on karma yoga krishna had said if you want freedom from bondage you should do all work as sacrifice to vishnu is there any connection between sacrifice to vishnu and devotional work that krishna explains in the next portion of this chapter he says there is a mystery behind performing sacrifices first of all he describes that there are many types of sacrifices which are described in the vedas what are the some of the types of sacrifices that are described in the vedas he mentions some of them some yogis offer sacrifice to the devatas others offer sacrifice to the supreme brahman then there are brahmacharis who offer sacrifice of the hearing process and there are grahasthas ideal grahasthas who follow the vedic injunctions to lead a regulated householder life they sacrifice sense enjoyment then there are people who control their mind and senses and offer sacrifice in the controlled mind then there are some people who undertake severe austerities and practice ashtanga yoga it is one type of yoga practice recommended in the vedic scriptures then some people accept strict vows of living a very austere life and they sacrifice their material possessions then there are others who study the vedic scriptures and in this way they advance in transcendental knowledge so their study itself is a form of sacrifice then there are those who practice pranayama or some breathing exercises as described in the vedic scriptures now they perform sacrifice through controlling their breathing itself there are yet others who simply by controlling their eating they are performing sacrifice so krishna concludes by telling all these performers of different sacrifices recommended in the vedas they know the meaning of sacrifice that's why they undertake so much trouble to do the sacrifice 
and because of that they become cleansed of all reactions and in this way they make gradual progress towards attaining the sp spiritual kingdom of God. Krishna says the importance of sacrifice is that without sacrifice no one can live happily in this world or in this planet. Therefore, sacrifice is absolutely essential for anybody who is seeking happiness. Now, all these different sacrifices, why are there so many different types of sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas? Krishna says, they are suited for people with different inclinations to work. As we know, not all people have got the same nature to work in a particular way. Different people are inclined to work differently. So according to their inclination to work differently, there are different types of sacrifices recommended. Now among these various sacrifices, Krishna clarifies that better than simply sacrifice some material possessions, one should perform sacrifice to acquire transcendental knowledge. Why? Because the ultimate goal of all sacrifices is transcendental knowledge. So now you can understand why is it that sacrifice, work done as sacrifice results in freedom from reaction. Because sacrifices lead to transcendental knowledge and working in transcendental knowledge is called devotional work and devotional work does not yield any reaction. So in this chapter Krishna has linked that sacrifice, performance of sacrifice to uh, becoming free from reactions through uh, acquiring transcendental knowledge. Now, to learn this transcendental knowledge properly, Krishna recommends approach a bona fide spiritual master. Now, he explains two things. What should be the qualification of a aspiring student who wants to get transcendental knowledge. So such an aspiring student should actually submit himself to a bona fide spiritual master. He should render service and he should make proper inquiries. Now the spiritual master also should be having certain qualification. What is that qualification of the spiritual master? He should be situated in transcendental knowledge himself. And he should have also realized the truth. He should have realized the truth. That means there are two aspects of this knowledge. One is the theoretical knowledge itself, which one can acquire by studying or by properly undergoing some training and the other aspect of transcendental knowledge is realizing that knowledge. That means, realizing means one should be able to act on the platform of such understanding. So a bona fide spiritual master is not only having this theoretical knowledge, transcendental knowledge, but he also has realized and therefore is perfectly acting on the platform of that transcendental knowledge. Now what is this transcendental knowledge all about? To summarize in one sentence Krishna summarizes what is this transcendental knowledge? He says, by this knowledge, 
he tells arjuna you will be able to see that all living beings without any exception are part of krishna they are situated in krishna and they belong to krishna three things he says about transcendental knowledge all living beings are part of krishna they are situated in krishna and they belong to krishna now this understanding is very very important this is the spiritual vision of every living being just like in the second chapter krishna says everyone is spirit soul not the body now this spirit soul is explained by krishna here as a part of krishna krishna is the supreme spirit the supreme whole the complete whole and everyone else is a tiny part part means each one of us we have a relationship with krishna and that relationship can be discovered by acquiring this transcendental knowledge that's what this chapter is all about now something wonderful about transcendental knowledge krishna says he glorifies this uh, transcendental knowledge as follows he says even if somebody is considered the most sinful person when he is situated in transcendental knowledge he is easily able to become completely sinless it is just like a blazing fire turns all firewood to ashes similarly the fire of transcendental knowledge burns away all reactions to all kinds of work so in this world there is nothing as sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge and one who has become accomplished in the practice of devotional service attains this knowledge within himself in course of time in other words krishna says if you want to get this transcendental knowledge if you want to realize this transcendental knowledge simply by engaging in devotional service you can actually get this knowledge and realize also further he says a faithful person who is dedicated to transcendental knowledge is eligible to get this knowledge and having achieved such knowledge he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace now in the second chapter krishna had explained that peace is a prerequisite for attaining the kingdom of god so uh, one who is dedicated to transcendental knowledge gets such knowledge and attains the supreme spiritual peace but if somebody is ignorant and faithless because he has doubt about krishna statement in this bhagavad gita such a person will not get transcendental knowledge instead he will fall down from his position and become more and more entangled in this world now one who acts in devotional service renouncing the results of all his activities and whose doubts are destroyed by transcendental knowledge such a person krishna concludes is free from all reactions is completely pure therefore krishna is finally concluding his instruction on transcendental knowledge to arjuna he tells whatever doubts that have arisen in your heart you should become free from all such doubts by situating situating yourself in transcendental knowledge and in this way you should stand up and fight see again krishna is giving a decisive uh instruction arjuna is always thinking should i fight or should i not fight 
third chapter arjuna had asked tell me decisively whether i should fight or not the conclusion was arjuna should fight fourth chapter again after explaining what is the link between sacrifice and becoming free from reactions through the explanation of transcendental knowledge krishna again tells arjuna becoming situated in transcendental knowledge stand up and fight and that's the end of this chapter thank you shrila prabhupad ki jai shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai